Kia ora tātou, everybody. Welcome to this fifth webisode in the series of Otato Nahiri, produced by Pure Advantage and Tane's Tree Trust. These webisodes are being hosted by our friends at the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. And uh, in today's webinar, we'll be looking at climate change, the threats and opportunities to our Nahiri, and also what role forests and especially native forests can play in reaching our 2050 net zero emissions target for New Zealand. And I'm joined by three experts in this area. Dr. Mark Kimberley, a statistician formerly with Scion and now an independent consultant. Uh, Dr. Sean Weaver, an expert in environmental finance and indigenous forest carbon markets. And Matt Walsh, who's the founder and MD of New Zealand Carbon Farming. Um, before we get into our panelists, um, just a reminder that we're very happy to take your questions. Um, please use the Q&A box that you can see there in Zoom for your questions. And also check out the chat because in the chat we put references if our panellists say something that we know there's a reference to on our website or if they mention a link, we'll try and include that in the chat uh, for further reference for you. Um, and uh, we will be finishing at 7.30, but um, you know there's so much more content available on our website and all of the contributors tonight are featured on our website. Um, and so there's a ton more information there for you to look at. That's pureadvantage.org. And of course, we'll be um, posting lots of stuff on social media. We really appreciate it if you can share on social to get the message out about this really important discussion about the role of native forests of our Nahiri in New Zealand, not just for climate change, but for our future prosperity across whatever way you want to measure it, whether it's commercial, spiritual, environmental, ecological, even cultural. So um, to our guests, um, in a minute, I'm going to ask our guests to introduce themselves, uh, but I might just do an ad actually, because next week, uh, the series continues and we have three um, am amazing guests that are going to be talking to us about uh, what role the government could play in expanding, protecting and enhancing our native Nahiri across New Zealand. And uh, I think that's going to be a really good episode too, because, um, you know, there is so much that we expect of government to do, um, but if we could be very pointed in our expectations, you know, we might actually achieve something. So um, to our guests, well, uh, I wonder if I could get them all to introduce themselves and we might start with you, Matt. Tell us about who you are a little bit and uh, what interests you in forests and in native forest especially. Thanks Vince. Uh, Matt Walsh from New Zealand Carbon Farming. Uh, our business is about growing trees to preserve the planet. Uh, so we own and manage the largest privately owned conservation estate in New Zealand and we grow those trees to contribute to climate change, not for harvest. We've been doing that for more than a decade and we have 66 million trees that we're growing uh, to protect the climate. 66 million trees seems like a lot. It is really a lot, uh, and um, but that's uh, just getting started from our point of view. We have lots more to do. Uh, and when we started out, we all had young kids. Uh, and so we wanted to do something that would make a difference for their futures, uh, as well as for all New Zealanders. Yeah. And at the time, climate change was already out there as a problem, but really very little was being done to address it. And so we established New Zealand Carbon Farming as a way of investing and doing something to make a difference for the climate. And for us, we saw the opportunity to establish permanent nature reserves that will continue to have a positive impact over hundreds of years. And as we've grown, we've attracted passionate, talented people who love the idea of getting up in the morning and going to work to help the environment, which is what our business is all about. Mm. But what I'm most proud of is that myself and my co-founder, Bruce Miller, are just a couple of local guys who have started a business with an ambition to make a difference. And over time, we've been able to achieve more and that ambition has got bigger. So together, we're proof that on an individual level, you can make a difference to climate change, provided you have the drive and ambition to do so. Yeah, good stuff. All right, well, we'll come back to talking about New Zealand carbon farming later and uh, really looking forward to you explaining the business model. Uh, but to you, uh, Mark Kimberley, tell us about who you are and uh, what's your interest in native forests. So I worked for many years at Sion and Rotorua um, researching various aspects of trees and how they grow and growth rates and 
things like that, um, both exotic species like radiata pine and also native species. So, um, and, and in the last um, decade or so, a lot of my time has spent looking at um, carbon sequestration by trees and um, how it's done and how how much carbon trees can remove from the atmosphere and um, and, and that sort of thing. Mm. So I, I retired from Sion a couple of years ago and I've been just doing things that interest me since then really, um, including um, I've done quite a lot of work with Tane's Tree Trust on um, looking at some of their data that they have. They are a, an organization concerned with um, fostering basically the growing of native trees in New Zealand and um, they have quite a lot of data measurements and plots and uh, stands of planted native trees and also regenerating native um, forest around the country and um, using some of my um, experience I've been able to work out the, the rates at which these um, native forests are sequestering carbon. Mm. Well, I'm looking forward to asking you about that in a minute because we want the detail. But um, Sean, please um, tell us a bit about your background and again your connection to New Zealand forests. Thanks, Vincent. Yes, yeah, Sean Weaver Ecos. Uh, I have a, a background in forest ecology and forest conservation that goes back to the 1980s and started my career trying to protect rainforests in the Pacific Islands <clears throat> and learned very early on that people who own these forests uh, need to make a living. Um, and if we're going to invite them to protect them, we need to find another way for them to make a living on their own land. And the same is true for New Zealand farmers who own land in order to make a living. And uh, forest conservation on that land will commonly um, prevent a certain type of productive activity. And if we don't compensate that landowner in some way for giving up rights to perhaps a less sustainable activity on their land, then they're less likely to voluntarily protect, uh, grow or protect forests on their land. So um, I've been involved for the last 30 years, I suppose, and in helping to cover the opportunity cost of landowners that are giving up certain rights to logging, for example, <clears throat> and, and funding that through compensatory payments. So when when carbon markets came along, uh, there's an opportunity to fund this activity without having ask, having to ask governments or, or philanthropy to fund uh, that um, that compensatory payment. And um, and that's why I got involved in carbon markets in the mid 2000s. Um, at the time, I was teaching mm. environmental studies at Victoria mm. University, and somebody left the door open, and I snuck out and established ECOS. <laughs> I let you go. <laughs> so <laughs> it's essentially what it is. And so we work on both sides of the carbon market at ECOS. We we help businesses and organisations and products go zero carbon through mm. carbon footprint measurement that mm. informs a carbon mm. reduction plan, and then. Uh, if people want to go zero, they typically have to buy offsets. Yeah. Uh, and then we supply offsets from um, native forest carbon projects in New yeah. Zealand and also in the Pacific Islands. So yeah. um, that's essentially what we do. Fantastic. Well, that's a great depth of experience. So we're looking forward to tapping into that, Sean. I thought we, uh, we should frame the problem. Uh, so this episode is about the role that forests could play in mitigating climate change, or at least the playing a part in helping us meet our objectives as a nation and also looking at some of the threats. But let's look at the problem. And I thought, Mark, you were, um, uh, sorry, Matt, you're pretty well positioned given that you've um, built a career out of this. Could you describe to us the nature of uh, the role? Uh, you know, give us a sense of just how much uh, sequestration is going to be required if we are going to meet that 2050 net emissions um, target. So I feel like this is the hospital pass question, to be honest. <laughs> uh, you know, there's just so many different numbers swirling around climate change and uh, trying to make sense of all of that is uh, quite difficult. So I'm going to try and simplify that this evening, if that's even possible. Uh, and uh, fortunately, the Ministry for the Environment has just released the latest climate numbers. Um, so I've got some recent data to go on. And that latest report goes up to 2019, when our, our national emissions were 83 million tons tons of carbon. 
And that's an increase of 2% over the year before that, which might not seem like much of an increase, but it's the largest single annual rise this century. So we're going backwards in terms of our targets. Between 1990 and 2018, our emissions rose 57% over that period, one of the worst performers in the OECD. And while for 2020 emissions, you're likely to see a significant drop caused by COVID, but that's really a one-off. And so getting to our net zero target at 2050 is gonna take real effort to turn around that current trend. And of course, it's not just the local commitments that we've got to take into account. New Zealand, along with every other country, has international obligations to reduce our emissions under the Paris Agreement. And the numbers on that are that by 2030, New Zealand has pledged to cut its emissions to 30% below 2005 and 11% below 1990. And if you look at that 1990 number, tar that target, that's quite interesting because it's going to be really tough to move our emissions to 11% below 1990 when at 2018 we were 57% above. Mm. So that kind of illustrates the scale of the difference uh, and, and the challenge that we face. But it gets even tougher for us this year because at the UN Climate Conference in December, all countries are expected to set an even more ambitious target than the one we have now. So that hurdle is about to get higher. And in order to meet those targets, the government's established the Climate Change Commission, who's recently produced a report, and that report shows that we're gonna miss our 2050 target by 6 million tonnes. So that's the gap, if you like, that you're talking about. That's the gap. And really the commission is asking a lot of us between now and 2050. And they're talking about things like uh, reducing uh, pure uh, petrol and diesel cars, reducing stock numbers, pushing down emissions from power generation and air conditioning and fridges. But really, they're leaning pretty heavily on trees for that 2050 target. And they have some very, very ambitious goals uh, for tree planting uh, over the next 30 years. And those targets uh, will see New Zealand plant um, certainly more indigenous trees than it's ever uh, planted before with a target of 16,000 hectares of new indigenous plantings per year by 2025 and 25,000 hectares per year for the 20 years following that. And in Just to, um, to clarify, even if we are reducing in uh, uh, our gross, our, our, in fact, our, let's not talk about gross and net just yet, but even if we are reducing by these measures such as reducing herd numbers and shifting cars to electrics and more, more um, cycling and walking and so on, there's always going to be a component that needs to be sequestered because we're not going to be able to reduce enough to make those targets and, and trees are the easiest form of sequestration. I think, uh, in my opinion, uh, trees are really only designed to buy us time for this problem. Trees buy us time to do the hard yards. They buy us time to do the things which fundamentally reduce our emissions. And that's the things you talk about, walking, cycling, driving electric cars. Mm -hmm. Those fundamental behavior changes that you talk about, that stuff is hard. And it takes time to create those sorts of changes in an economy. Trees buy us time to get to our targets in the meantime while we're making those hard changes. And really, right. and, and, and so give us a sense of what scale of planting do you think? Uh, I, I know this is the hospital pass, Matt, but um, ah. you know, you, you, you're a big boy. Um, just give us a sense of the scale of planting that's required for us to, uh, for, for trees to do that job for us. Yeah, I think the commission summed it up pretty well, um, you know, with those those targets I mentioned earlier. Um, but honestly, those targets are extremely ambitious. And uh, I'd be surprised if those targets survive into the final report, um, because the industry is not equipped uh, to scale up to that kind of level uh, in the time periods they're anticipating. Um, certainly we need a lot more trees. We really need a lot more trees in order to help with this target. But it's only one piece of the puzzle. Trees are only one bit of the picture. Mm. Uh, the hard yards are going to have to be done at some point in the economy.
Uh, thank you, Matt. That was incredibly succinct and even I understood it. So that well done to answer that question. Mark, at, at least one of the, um, I suppose, misnomers around natives has been, as I understand it, that the that the ministry has not been ac accurately counting the um, effectiveness or the scale of sequestration that's offered by native trees, by native forests. Your work has, and the work of Tane Tree Trust, has really questioned the accuracy of those lookup tables that MPI produces around natives. Can you explain your work and have I described it correctly? Um, yeah, so um, MPI has these lookup tables that uh, they're, they're used for um, estimating how much carbon different types of forest can sequester um, as a sort of default value. And um, just roughly um, speaking, I think radiata pine, they, according to the lookup tables, it will sequester around 25 tonnes of CO2 from the atmosphere per hectare per year, roughly speaking. Uh, but according to the lookup tables, natives only do around about six tons per hectare per year. Um, but um, those tables are really pretty conservative, and, and uh, for the um, natives in particular, they are quite a bit lower than what we have found from our measurements of actual growth rates of trees. Um, natives, they 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 certainly sequester at a slow rate. Um, uh, for a while after you plant them, but eventually um, they they can actually start sequestering quite rapidly. And um, so we've looked at um, some stands of planted native trees, for example, a, a stand of Totara in Northland, which is around 100 years old, and it's currently carrying, it's sequestered over its lifetime around 1,500 tonnes of CO2, which means that it's averaged around 15 tonnes a year. Mm. Um, and it's currently averaging close to 30 tonnes a year. So it's kind of current uh, rate, which is way higher than what the native lookup table was suggesting. So uh, we don't so, need to go into huge detail, but Matt, uh, sorry, Mark, why is this? the case how did MPI get these numbers so um, I think the um, well it's kind of what they were intended to be used for um, they they're based largely I believe on regenerating uh, scrubland which is probably not the um, the best kind of native forest that you can grow for carbon um, and and they're probably deliberately fairly conservative anyhow for various reasons so um, there's a huge variation all, uh, when you look at all different types of forest, um, both native and exotic. And um, yeah, you, you, but um, certainly those are right at the low end of what you'd expect from natives. Um, you, you can certainly do much better um, mm. if you have the right sort of trees growing at the right stocking and on the good sites. Yes. What are the chances of the government or MPI in particular changing its stance or changing those lookup tables or are they internationally determined? No, I, I, I'm not an expert on how that was all done and but they're used for a specific purpose um, in the um, as a kind of default value for land for small landowners um, to work out how much carbon they're sequestering so they can claim carbon credits so they have a fairly limited use they're not really intended as a kind of general um, idea of what um, mm. trees will sequester um, so um, yeah so hopefully the the um, research we're doing and the, the measurements we're taking will give a better more accurate view of what mm. what you can expect to sequester from native forestry Sean, um, Sean Weaver, going to your experience with uh, both here and in the Pacific, <clears throat> would you say that the role of indigenous forest as a carbon source is, is it well understood and, and um, to what extent do these new figures that Tane's Tree Trust and, and uh, Mark is talking about elevate the potential for native forests to play a, a bigger role in climate mitigation? Yeah, um, firstly, 
native forests deliver a whole lot more services than just carbon storage, as many people fully understand. And the the benefit of native forest carbon projects and permanent forest projects, uh, like the projects that Matt's doing and the projects that we're doing, is that they're, they're delivering a, a broad range of ecosystem services, many of which are including building climate resilient landscapes that are going to have permanent forest on them and, and help uh, landscapes be more resilient to things like extreme weather events, like floods and, and, and droughts, and especially floods and flood damage. And, and this is true in New Zealand, but also, and especially in the Pacific Islands, which are very, very exposed to cyclone damage and the, the damage to the economies of the Pacific Islands and those communities is, is much more severe and intense than, than we get in New Zealand. So, on the one hand, there's a really important agenda to reduce emissions at the on the demand side, uh, but also sequester as much carbon as we can, but also to build as many climate resilient landscapes as we can. And this resilience is, is in, also incredibly important. And Matt pointed out that, you know, the tree solution buys us time from an, an emission emissions management perspective. But permanent forests do more than that as well. They 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 build resilient landscapes and those landscapes and landforms can can be maintained for thousands of years. So they're a, a permanent rehabilitation of erosion prone lands that really should never, many of them should never have been in pasture in the first place and are only profitable because they're exporting lots of sediment downstream and not having to pay the cost of that. So, um, you know, we've, we've got an opportunity in New Zealand at the moment to change the rural uh, landscape for the better, for, for, for resilience, um, and also protect biodiversity. I mean, New Zealand has suffered a massive biodiversity decline over the last couple of hundred years. You know, we're the last major landmass to be populated by humans in the world. And there's been a massive decline in biodiversity wherever we see farms it used to be forests most of the, most of the time. And oh, those lowland forests had very high biodiversity on, on them as a very unique landform. And so um, this carbon forestry agenda gives us an opportunity to turn back that tide, but do so in a way which actually makes a living for landowners. And that's the key point. That's true in New Zealand. It's also true in the Pacific Islands because in, in the islands uh, and in New Zealand, landowners on, on relatively marginal lands often struggle to make uh, a prosperous living on those lands anyway. And asking them to go into bat for the climate system without some sort of help financially is, is just not going to not going to really deliver. And, and we saw that with, you know, we tried to sort of recover the New Zealand East Cape from Cyclone Bowler with some stimulation and 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 and, and funding support, but it, it only really tinkered around the edges. We didn't do a, a very large scale reforestation of what could have been done. And we've got an opportunity to do that now. So um, on, the, on, the, on the adaptation and resilience side, great opportunities. On the emissions uh, management side, also great opportunities, but I, I also echo what Matt said. It's so important that we don't see forests as a get out of jail free card. They are part of the puzzle. And in fact, if we didn't use forests as part of the solution, we certainly wouldn't get there. That's not only for New Zealand, but globally. It's mm. also partly because globally, forests contribute um, a, a, a really significant proportion of, of global emissions, around about 15% or so of the global total of emissions comes from the global forest sector, which is probably about as big as the entire country of the United States across all sectors of emissions. So is that because of the emissions that come from the processing, the harvesting, the processing and the manufacture of, of, of timber products? That's, that's part of the puzzle, but when, when forests are, are cut down, and, and transformed into agricultural landscapes or degraded. The wood that's in those forests, which is built of out of carbon dioxide, stored as carbon in those trees, um, that decomposes and burns and, and mm. gets back in the atmosphere. So it's mostly emissions from the decomposition of that wood, which goes back into the air. And what we need to do all around the world is slow down the, the deforestation rates and slow down the forest degradation rates by protecting existing forests, existing biodiversity habitats and masterpieces, as well as growing new forests, which is akin to paying new and young painters to, to, to build future masterpieces. Mm. So it, it's, it's a really important complementary measure to the global effort to reduce emissions and to manage our, um, our 
uh, global climate change aspirations. But I think what you're, if I can summarise, or uh, what you're saying is that the, the climate emergency is providing a perfect opportunity for us to reforest and discover and enjoy the full benefits of forest. All the things we've talked about previously on these episodes, you know, the the, the non-timber benefits of forests, whether they're commercial, such as tourism or honey, um, through to the spiritual and ecological values of, of just being uh, alive and well, um, through to the, as you say, the kind of mitigation factors of um, of providing resilience. That that the climate emergency is a perfect excuse, if you like, for rediscovering and reinvesting in forests in general. Yeah, it's a, it's. I agree. It's a great incentive for us to rediscover the value of trees and forested landscapes for a broad range of ecosystem services that they provide. Among which include. Um, the well-being we get from um, being um, wrecked less as an economy when the next cyclone hits, but also benefiting from the fact that um, spending time in forests and having forested landscapes is good for uh, our well-being in, in so many other ways. But uh, it's really valuable. It's really valuable to to measure the financial and economic benefits of those ecosystem services, as well as the the non. Um, economic or non-financial benefits, because when we add up those financial benefits, they add up to quite a lot. So, for example, if you were to have a climate resilient landscape that experienced extreme weather events like cyclones, but did less damage to, say, the economy of Hawke's Bay, um, then you can actually put a price on the value of that hinterland Mm -hmm. management and that price is the avoided cost of all of that damaged infrastructure all of those damaged roads and bridges and all of those damaged farms and, and, and houses and productivity and and this is very much about building a resilient economy so so this is not just a, a mission to look after nature it's a mission to look after people as well mm. Now, there are forests and forests, and I suppose the um, emphasis of this whole series has been about growing indigenous forest, native forest, and the the challenge that we have in New Zealand is that at the moment we have a lot of exotic Pinus radiata, a terrific tree, there's no denying it, um, and has a role. And so I'm really curious, um, Matt, about your business model, which does see huge planting of native forest, uh, excuse me, of exotics on traditional New Zealand farmland uh, with a view, as I understand it, to transitioning to native forests eventually over time. I wonder if you could explain your business model um, and, and, um, and what the opportunity is both in the short term and in the long term. Sure, and thanks Vince. Um, so as I mentioned, our business is growing trees to preserve the planet and uh, over the last decade, our trees have captured more than 20 million tonnes of carbon, which is the equivalent of taking every car off New Zealand roads for a whole year. Or to make it live for you, since you've been on this webinar, uh, our trees have stored about 160 tonnes of carbon, uh, which is like taking about 160 cars off the road since you logged on. Uh, so that's kind of the scale at which we're operating at. But we're ambitious and we have uh, set ourselves major goals to do much more. This year alone, we'll plant 7 million trees uh, on top of the 66 we currently have. And it's interesting that Sean mentioned the landowner uh, income. So to make it worthwhile for landowners, you have to uh, find a way to help them live. And we partner with uh, thousands of landowners in New Zealand, uh, iwi, farmers uh, and individuals. And over that time, we've paid them 73 million uh, in carbon income over our 10 years. So we're certainly doing our part to make it attractive uh, for landowners to uh, consider permanent forestry. Um, and so, I just ask a, a really quick question, Matt. That 73 million is derived from issuing carbon credits? Exactly. So that's carbon income derived from the land that the forests have been planted on. So it's essentially, as Sean says, uh, the reward or the compensation that the landowner gets uh, for putting that uh, forest or putting that land into forest. Um, and as you mentioned, our focus is on planting permanent regenerating forests. So I'll talk about what that is to answer your question. Uh, so there's a number of components to this, but I'll try and summarize it. Uh, the approach starts with the selection of the right land, and that's absolutely critical uh, for the program to be successful. 
For us, we look for the rough country, the steep erosion prone country, often isolated and hard to get to. And over 95% of our 66 million trees are planted on really marginal farmland. Mm -hmm. So we don't plant on quality farmland. And that's been our operating model for 11 years, long before it was topical to talk about it. So Sean mentions the opportunity to reorient the landscape. Um, and for us, we're focused on that, that land that perhaps shouldn't have been in farmland in the first place. That's the stuff that we're after. Any better land that we come across, we sell back into the community so it can continue to be farmed. Last year alone, we sold nine small farms back into local communities. So we're very much about the right tree in the right place, and that's always been our operating model. And you don't necessarily have to own that land. Your point is you're leasing it from the existing owners? Exactly. So about half of our trees we own ourselves, land and trees, uh, and the other half we partner with uh, ex uh, uh, landowners who um, are interested in deriving a carbon income from those trees. So having selected that kind of marginal land, we then look for land where there are existing native trees that can provide a seed stock to kickstart the process of regeneration. And our estate currently includes 6,000 hectares um, of native forests. And we look for blocks which have indigenous forest already scattered around, amongst the, the block, or perhaps are around the outside of the block. That's the ideal type of land for us. That's what we look for. Once we've chosen that block, we then establish what's called a nurse crop. Um, and this acts kind of like an umbrella. Uh, which protects and nurtures the indigenous species underneath. And then by carefully managing that nurse crop, we can create the right environment for it to regenerate over time into an indigenous and biodiverse forest. And along the way, the annual income from the carbon provides the ongoing resources necessary to make that transition possible. So that's essentially how we operate our model and how gen regeneration works in a practical context. And that science has been around since the 70s. Uh, and for the last three years, we've worked with an independent team of forest scientists to pull together all of that research uh, and start the process of operationalizing it. And that process is ongoing, but we're very optimistic about the progress we've made so mm -hmm. far. Do you share any of the concerns that are in the community at the moment about the predominance of radiata forest as an alternative, uh, or as as a fast growing part of the um, farmland? And I'm thinking in particular the you know, the some of the concerns around, uh, for instance, the loss of farmland. You say that you're 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 not targeting productive pasture. Yeah, look, exactly. And uh, there's a lot of debate about this at the moment. Um, but for us, that's always been a fundamental value of ours. We're not interested in planting on land that is productive as farmland. Um, our opinion, and it is only our opinion, uh, is that trees should not be planted uh, on land that is productive for farming. That's just our opinion, but that's our, our operating philosophy. Uh, we sympathize uh, with the concerns that communities express uh, about uh, how that land is being locked up um, and what that means for their communities. But our model of regeneration is very labor intensive. Um, so we create jobs in the communities where we plant long term jobs, because there's a lot of work that needs to go on in these forests over many decades. Yeah, I'm really curious about that management. Um, uh, exercise because uh, I'm assuming that you know by some miracle native forests don't just spring up uh, at, underneath the, the the darkened canopy of a pine forest. So can you tell us about what kind of you know, yeah tell us about that management? Yeah, how do you manage a transition um, and and maybe even get some give us some specific examples of of areas that you see it working in. It's very, very site specific is the first point to make. So every block will need a different plan and every block will need more or less management intervention to get it to its destination. Uh, and so it's critical that having identified the right kind of block that has the right potential, uh, that you then have the right plan in place for making it possible. And so having established the nurse crop that we've talked about, the way that you encourage the indigenous to come through is by creating light wells in that canopy. Uh, 
And so essentially it's like punching holes in the canopy of the forest and letting light in underneath. And so exactly how you do that, where you do it, when you do it, how big the holes are, where they are in the forest, when exactly in the evolution of the forest that you do it, are all critical decisions that need to be made and are very site specific. In many cases, if you've got the right established indigenous, either around the outside or with, ideally within the forest, you will have momentum of seed source, which will create what's called seed rain in these light wells, uh, which will start to kickstart that process of natural regeneration. But in reality, there's also going to need to be some planting. We need to plant uh, understory uh, indigenous in those light wells in order to get them going. And also the, the other critical aspect of this is pest control. And I know you're gonna come on and talk about that in a minute, but if you're all you're doing is growing candy for pests to eat, uh, then you're wasting your time. You've <laughs> got to get control of those animals and get them out and keep them out of those blocks for the program to be successful. It, it's an expensive exercise that what you're talking about. It, it does the business model sustain that level of management and in particular does it sustain it over the long term because what time frame um, matter we're talking about for this kind of in, according to your model to for this regeneration to occur look the science uh, indicates that it takes decades you know this is a long-term process but a lot of the groundwork can be done early so if you choose the right block you plant the right nurse crop you have the right holes or light wells punched in the forest at the right time and you establish the right indigenous in those light wells in an environment without predators, then you have set the forest on the right path. All of those actions happen in the first 30 years of the forest. So really what you're talking about is investing the majority of your money in the first 30 years. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, because of the way our model works, the radiata trees produce a lot of carbon credits, absorb a lot of carbon, produce a lot of carbon credits over that crucial 30 years. And that's not only when the planet needs it the most, but that's when the money is needed the most in the project in order to do those activities. And who, who does that labour, Matt? Is that something that you take on yourselves as, as um, carbon farming, or is that an obligation of the landowner? It uh, depends on the arrangement. Typically, uh, where we are planting on other people's land, we take responsibility for that management. Um, but in the case particularly of iwi groups, uh, who are very interested in uh, the creation of uh, skills and employment opportunities uh, in their areas, uh, we will look to um, have a structured plan around how we use local people on particular blocks. Sean, the the model sounds fantastic. Thank you, Matt, um, for answering those questions. The model does sound fantastic. And uh, if if it was successful, um, I guess we would be feeling quite excited about this opportunity. But what confidence do you have as a scientist that the model is correct? What confidence do you have as an ecologist that this level of management can be sustained uh, to actually deliver in the end, an indigenous forest? You know, it's a very good question. It's a question that we get asked a lot with the work that we do. So like uh, New Zealand carbon farming, we use occasionally a, a mixed model. So just as a, as a preface, our, our planting model will plant native trees only when we can. And sometimes the whole project can be native only. Um, but what it will do is deliver a, an economic performance, which is nowhere near as good as uh, when the exotics are involved. But if the landowner and the investor are happy with that, then 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 it's natives only. In fact, there's an investment that we've just been brokering, um, finalising today, where it's 100% natives. Um, it's just that the internal rate of return is a bit more pedestrian than what might be delivered from a project with pine trees in it, but um, or any other exotic. So pine trees are not the only exotic, of course. An exotic tree is any tree that didn't come from New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And there's an awful lot to choose from which aren't going to go wild and that are going to create good nursery species and got to perform well as a carbon crop. Um, but with our model, um, 
if the internal rate of return or the economic performance of the native only project doesn't quite get to the magic number, doesn't quite get over the line for the landowner and or the investor, then we our, our model is to then introduce um, a hectare or another hectare or another hectare of, of exotics in a, imagine it's a hundred hectare project and it doesn't quite get over the line. So then we introduce one, two, three, four, five and hectares of, of exotics until we get to that magic number. Because for us, the, the exotics serve uh, at least two purposes. One is to fund the natives and the other one is to fund the natives. Because if you can't fund your dreams, you, your dreams will stay dreams. You won't be able to turn them into reality. So financing the gig is so important. And if, you know, there's many, and I, I come from a kind of a pure native forest ecology background, and I've realized that um, perfect is the enemy of the good. And especially in a climate emergency, and especially when there's not unlimited grant money floating around for people to just go out and cover the landscape and trees, because conservation costs money. And so even if you're maximizing the native element, uh, commonly there will be a need to introduce some exotics to the mix. Now the question is then, well, well how do you manage those exotics? Uh, and of course, uh, that will differ depending on the model that you're using. And Matt's approach is, is a model that cr essentially creates that shade and shelter to provide a micro environment in those light wells to enable native forest to regenerate. Now, people who understand native forest regeneration will know that native forests regenerate in light wells in the native forest. So you can imagine a notion of native forest and then imagine holes in that forest whenever a big tree falls over. That creates a light gap and a light environment for, for native forest regeneration in that forest. And, and so forest ecologists who have understood this, as Matt has said, from the 70s, know that you can regenerate for native forests in those kind of light wells. And if the, if the starting forest is not a native forest, well, the natives in the light well probably don't care that much. In fact, they're probably quite happy that they've got an environment to live in at all. Because remember, that environment used to be marginal pasture and had been marginal pasture for many, many decades. And so... Um, transitioning into this uh, mixed model is certainly a lot better often than erosion prone pasture. Then, as I've said, the, the, the way we manage um, the exotics um, in our model is slightly different where we would, um, uh, let's say we plant 100 hectares of, of, of land and, and I don't know, 30 hectares of that is exotics. Um, then those exotics, we would begin creating corridors in that exotic forest uh, after about 12 years, um, take out 10%, replace it with natives and actively plant those natives. And then five years later, do the same. And then five years later, do the same. And if you can carry on doing that, you'll find that in 60 years, you've got a, nat a pure native forest where the exotics have been in there for that early period. And then they're no longer needed and they're out. Also, another, another thing that's important is that if you're doing this on private land, um, people typically don't want their land value to go to zero. And if you've got no productive activity ever forecasted after 60 years, then the land value is gonna drop even now. And so it's important to maintain that land value by having an opportunity for some sort of cash flow in the future. Now, one way to do that is to have uh, some sort of crop that you can harvest and replace in the future. Uh, and the way that we would do it is to have a native crop of say totra like what Tane, Tane's Trees Trust has, has done and where you then begin harvesting that totra in sustainable forest management continuous canopy modalities starting in maybe year 80 and then you've got a, a, an opportunity for a cash flow from really high quality native timbers uh, essentially um, in perpetuity as you've transitioned from marginal farmland into permanent forest, which is maintaining that cash flow. Because after 100 years, you're still going to have to kill possums and, and stoats and ferrets unless somebody has come up with a, a clever trick to eradicate them in the meantime. And so there's always a need. And even if it wasn't for those pests, there's always a need for conservation management. Mm. And so financing that through an intervention that creates a cash flow from that landscape is, is, is highly valuable. And again, just to reiterate the point that the perfect is the enemy of the good. If we were to try and just be um, not touching these forests at all, then the business model wouldn't work and we just wouldn't even get started. Sure. So compromise is important here. A, a question for Mark. Um, as a scientist, as someone been involved in the forestry sector for a long time, uh, do you think that we are taking a gamble by using as much pine as we are um, on the hope 
really that intergenerationally we're going to be able to manage them um, to transition. In other words, are you buying the argument that Matt and um, Sean are putting forward? Um, yeah, I mean, um, certainly the pines will grow very well for you know, 100 years or more um, and sequester a lot of carbon. Um, exactly how that transition is done, I think it, it, would, it certainly would be fairly tricky to, to manage. Um, and it's probably a bit outside my area of expertise to really to talk too much about it. But um, um, it's certainly not a, a simple thing to do um, to transition from an exotic um, you know, forest through into a native, um, which require quite a lot of intervention, I would think. Um, I mean, the, the, under the pine trees will um, grow in the in the canopy what develops underneath unless um, there's a fair amount of light getting in is, is going to be pretty minimal. Um, there'll certainly be a, a lot of different species growing up there but not much actual um, carbon stored in the understory. Mm -hmm. um, so um, exactly how you would encourage that to develop is um, I think it still requires quite a lot of work and um, it, it certainly wouldn't be easy. Can I just add to that too, um, Mark? Yeah. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we, in our model, actively remove the exotics and then actively plant the natives in those in those corridors um, so that we can then manage that transition. It's a more expensive model um, and um, the internal rates of return will be lower. Uh, and so I guess the, the success of middle path solutions is very much dependent on the appetite for investors to take a lower than absolute maximum return on their, on their investment. Because if the internal rate of return, in other words, is similar to the interest rate on money invested, if that is a lower number, we can deliver more and more native only plantings or minimize the number of exotics that go in. And also the word exotic doesn't just mean pine trees. It can mean evergreen mm. oaks, for example. I mean, if you walk even here in Christchurch, which is kind of a very dry, uh, sunburnt landscape. Um, you go up to Victoria Park and, and walk around under the oak trees there and it's, the understory is full of natives. Um, and so exotics uh, include things like oaks. Um, they include uh, leafy trees as well as uh, softwood species which are the, the pine trees and the, the redwoods and things like that. But fundamentally if the economics don't work then it's going to stay marginal farmland. And this is where, yes, we do have to take a gamble because the gamble of not acting is, is a bigger gamble. I think that's a key thing to take home is the cost of doing nothing, the cost of not doing this kind of work is going to be far greater than the cost of making an error here and there. And, and what, what Matt's uh, company is doing and what we're doing is getting the best advice available. Sometimes the same scientists are involved and I'm a, I've got a PhD in forestry myself. So we, we're, we're doing our due diligence on the, the forestry models uh, to minimize these risks and use best practice. And also if you've got an adaptive management regime, you can adapt your management through time as you learn more. Matt will be able to do that in his projects. We've designed our pro projects to do that as well. Uh, I, I will leave this issue, but I just want to uh, ask one question to Matt, if I may. Matt, what accountability is there? Should should part of, and I'm not saying the entire model would fail, but if parts of your program, for instance, there might be parts of the country where pests get out of control or where you've introduced a fire risk because you've got a permanent forest, um, what accountability exists for you uh, and for those landowners who, uh, and presumably, you know, this accountability needs to be intergenerational if the model doesn't prove to be as successful as we hope. Yeah, look, I'm pleased you've asked that question um, because there is a um, very strong answer to it. Um, so legislation passed last year creates a new permanent forest category in the ETS. Uh, and that permanent forest category effectively ensures that forests are protected in perpetuity by creating tough penalties for the people managing those forests. 
So essentially, if you register your forests in that permanent forest category, you are exposing yourself personally, not your company, you personally to penalties uh, for not managing those forests in accordance with the permanent forest uh, regime. And I'd go so far as to say that no forest project, exotic or indigenous, can say that its trees are protected in perpetuity unless they are registered in that permanent forest category with the associated personal obligations for those involved. For our part, we will register all of our forests in that permanent forest category in the ETS. That makes us highly motivated to resolve any of those issues that Sean talks about um, and any of the uncertainties that Mark mentioned. Uh, we have our heads in the lion's mouth here, and that's how much we believe in the potential for regeneration to benefit New Zealand and the planet. Thank you for answering that, Matt. Um, there are so many questions and we're just not going to get time to go to them. So let, let me just throw a couple to you. And this is probably one for Sean and for Matt. Uh, it's from Jackie Amos, who's one of our contributors and a tree ecologist and scientist. So she asks, um, in, in particular, she's curious to know what kind of trees are being planted? What types of trees has your company been investing in for permanent forests? And a related question, can you can you explain in more detail uh, exactly how that transition happens once the pines reach their maturity? Sure, well, I can have a quick go at that first and then pass over to Matt. Um, so, for example, the investment model that we looked at today and that we've been working on the last um, month or so, a few months, is um, native species. So it's planting um, species that are already growing on the landscape that the project is going to be located on. It's some Maori land up in Northland. And um, so that's a that's a native forest. It's going to have a mixture of Totara, uh, there'll be some Manaka, there's some Mahui. Um, there's a range of a range of species. Uh, one of the interesting things when you plant native forests or plant any forest is that nature is also going to do some of the planting for you mm. and that's going to come from the the, the the kind of seed rain that Matt mentioned where uh, nature will through bird dispersal and also through wind dispersal will bring native seeds to the site and um, so an element of the project will be planted by nature anyway. Uh, for us when there's an exotic element um, let's say the farmer wants a woodlot uh, as part of the project to lift the performance because maybe natives on their own won't compete with beef and lamb revenue that they're giving up, then um, it's really up to the farmer um, to determine what their preference is. One farmer that we've worked with wants um, oaks on their land um, and so oaks are, are going in. Um, another landowner wanted eucalypts on their land and so eucalypts are going in. Um, others want um, uh, a, a redwood, um, a redwood forest for that woodlot. Others want a pine. Um, and, and the reasons to choose these things might relate to what kind of wood you want from it when it comes to harvest time. It might relate to the costs of establishing them. You know, a pine seedling is about 45 cents. Uh, a, uh, uh, a eucalypt seedling might be 65 cents and a um, a redwood might be a dollar eighty, say, and and seedling price is a very sensitive part of the financial model, and so your choice of seedling type is going to impact a lot on the economic performance of the project. So, when it comes to the transition uh, to to natives, um, so for us, uh, the the as I mentioned before, uh, imagine there's X hectares of exotic, whether it's a softwood or a hardwood, um, then uh, that will be managed as a, essentially an exotic woodlot after um, about 12 years. It depends on the species and it depends on the situation, but let's imagine it's about 12 to 15 years. The first corridor of, of that exotic forest is cut down and then replanted in natives. And in those early years, you're not going to get really any cost recovery on that timber because it's not really merchantable at that very young age. But as that the, the, the five years later, do it again, and five years later, do it again. And as you continue that process, the timber that you're taking out of the forest uh, can fund the reforestation of that same corridor in natives. 
Um, and so essentially we're actively using the exotics to fund the planting of the natives uh, and ideally planting a, a majority of the area in natives anyway. And then the minority which has exotics, that minority area would be transitioned through um, this corridor model. Uh, so that if you repeat that, if you do 10% removal and replacement every five years, then within, fifth, within 60 years, you've now got a, a fully native forest where you started off with an exotic woodlot. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, Matt, in the interests of time, I'm going to ask you a different question. It's kind of related, but I'm, I'm uh, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you a chance to go into detail about the transition, but I'm curious to know about this, and we've had several questions about the uh, continuous cover forestry. And... Uh, does your model allow for continuous cover forestry? Are, are you will you be harvesting uh, trees within your permanent forests? And can you, if if you are, can you explain the model? Yeah, so we won't be harvesting. We are a no harvest model. Uh, we the only cutting of trees that we do in the forest are to create light wells. Um, other than that, we do not remove timber. We do not look for timber as an income stream. Um, so we are a pure uh, regeneration model from day one. We're looking to how we can transition that forest as quickly as possible. And is that a lost opportunity? And do you think it's a, uh, an opportunity or a, a model that you think you could change over time? Yeah, look, uh, we're aware of Sean's model and, and uh, the potential to add additional income streams always is more attractive from an investment point of view. Um, you know, honestly, we've got our hands full um, with the scale of our uh, portfolio and uh, perfecting the operationalization of regeneration uh, with our scientists. Um, so, but that's certainly something we may look at in the future. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, there was a question here. Uh, there's quite a few questions also related to soil, um, and I'm not sure if we're going to have what time are we. We're actually on 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 the, the dot seven thirty. But um, there's a question here from Paula Warren, for instance: Is how is carbon sequestered into soils rather than standing crop factored into sequestering measures? And I, I don't know if Mark, do, are you are you interested in answering that question? Uh, well, just briefly, um, so soil is um, certainly there's a huge amount of carbon stored in forest soils, um, and it often basically isn't measured or not very accurately because it's very hard to actually measure it. Um, uh, but um, certainly it's a big factor, but most of the models that we develop aren't actually taking any account of the soil. Um, and the, the assumption is that the soil, that changes in the soil are fairly gradual anyhow. Also, there's no economic instrument in the ETS to measure soil. So even if you did measure soil, and if the soil measurement demonstrated that there was a whole lot of beneficial soil carbon sequestration, uh, you couldn't turn that into any carbon credits. So um, that would be a co-benefit of a project, a wee bit like a biodiversity co-benefit. Perhaps a question for next week's panel, Vince. <laughs> I, think, I think it could be because next week we are looking at mechanisms and oh, we will get into the ETS as well next week and it's deficiencies in uh, offering solutions around um, all, all the elements of forests, including soil. Uh, we are out of time and I feel like we've only just started um, and I, I feel sorry for you that you, uh, you haven't had a chance to ask, answer, uh, have all your questions um, answered on the chat, um, but please do keep them coming in. I think... Simon, is there any way that we could we could continue with this online in another form? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, he's saying yes, so um, we, we, we'll get on to it. So you guys haven't got off yet. We're going to come back to you. Um, look, it's been a real pleasure talking about this. Uh, we do feel like we have uh, only just uh, scraped the, the, uh, the surface of what the potential is for forests uh, to provide climate resilience and, um, and sequestration. So let me please thank you, Mark Kimberley, Matt Walsh and um, Sean Weaver for joining us. Thank you to all of our audience who have uh, joined us tonight. Good numbers, good questions. Um, and please do come back next week because we've got Dr. David Hall from AUT, also Annabelle Chartres from PwC, both of who have contributed to the Aotearoa Circle uh, and to Pure Advantage um, 
thinking about uh, biodiversity credits and other mechanisms that could be used to incentivize uh, foresters and landowners. And also Kevin Prime, who is actually a living, breathing example of a landowner and uh, of, of a family business that is doing very much the things we talked about in today's episode, um, planting native and exotic forests and a and a whanau run business. So we look forward to that episode. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Thank you to the team and um and no hora.